Hello, and welcome to the next installment of Anna Reads. Luther is over there, so expect there to be a black cat cruising in and out of this video, okay? We are on chapter one of Unmentionable, The Victorian Lady's Guide to Sex, Marriage, and Manners by Teresa O'Neill. So let's dive right in, shall we? Let's see, where were we? Chapter one, chapter one. Yes, chapter one, getting dressed. How to properly hide your shame. No time to waste. Open your eyes. Awaken into your new life. You're in a sparsely decorated bedroom. The sheets are rough to the touch. The mattress hard. The air so chilly it shows your breath and someone has left a pot of cold pee under your bed. Honestly. You've arrived, dear one. The year doesn't matter, nor the precise place. You don't have time to wonder at the details. You're expected downstairs. We must begin our lessons with haste. So let's get you dressed, shall we? Pull off that surprisingly coarse linen nightdress and you'll be standing bare and shivering in your bedroom. Don't worry, you'll soon be wearing more layers than a five-year-old on a snow day. Open your armoire and see if you can find some underwear. Back in the 21st century, you loved your underwear, didn't you? Whether you were sunk snug inside your granny panties or rocking a sexy Saturday night bra held together with only a scrap of red lace and pure sexual magnetism, they felt good. Luther, if you're gonna be in the way, come say hello. This is Luther. Now go on, you're encrusted in pollen. Would you leave? He won't leave. That which wobbled was bound comfortably and pleasantly presented. That which might leak or smudge was assured an extra layer of modesty. Yes, you're being very friendly today. I'd best break it to you early. You're going to be wearing a lot of things under your dress during your time here, but none of them will have a crotch. Your privates are going to be traveling unaccompanied today, Luther. Under miles of fabric, to be sure, but with a direct line of sight to the floor. Ever wonder why the saucy, high-kicking can-can dance at the Moulin Rouge was so popular? It wasn't because the dancers were showing their stockings or even their legs. You have a bare bottom for good reasons. You will be wearing very heavy, long skirts that you'll never have cause to lift above your ankles, parenthetically, unless a good wind comes and flips your crinoline over your head. And if that happens, you'll have to move to a new town and change your name, end parentheses, so you risk no exposure. Why would you need a crotch? more parentheses. One, well, one reason periodically comes to mind, but we'll cover that in another chapter, close parentheses. To really understand how terrific it is to have nude nethers, we have to finish getting you dressed. So put on your chemise. It's a lot like the nightgown you just took off, except lighter, wide-necked, and short-sleeved. It's actually quite pleasant. If you were back in the 21st century, you might wear it as a fun, simple sundress to a summer barbecue or Shakespeare in the park. Yes, 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 scratchy, scratchy, scratchy. I have the good nails for a reason. However, if you do that here in the 19th century, you won't even have to worry about moving to a new town. You'll be safely tucked away in a sanitarium where you will be strapped into frigid ice baths and given fantastic doses of opium until your hysteria subsides. Move your tail. Remember, the center of a woman is her uterus, her crazy, crazy uterus. Now, even though we're leaving your lady parts free to sway in the breeze, we still need to cover your legs. The bottom part with stockings, of course, knitted and held up with garters, not a garter belt, garters. These were actual tapes or ribbons that you tied around your thighs or knees. What covers the rest of your leg varies over the course of the century and could include pantaloons, bloomers, chemilettes, pantalettes, leglets, or Turkish trousers. 
They're all basic upper leg coverings worn under your chemise tied at the waist. We actually have an open drawers, not diagram, but picture. Seen here, if I could move the cap. And until the end of the century, the legs don't connect to each other at the top. They're left split with a slight overlap for modesty. So, chemise, stockings, garters, and crotchless pantalettes. You're still practically naked. All your wobbly bits, there they are, just wobbling. That won't do. Oh, how you'll miss your cherished bra collection on this journey. Work bras, sports bras, date night bras, the fraying soft cupped. I'm not leaving this couch until I've watched every single episode of Downton Abbey bras. Brassiers won't become popular until the 1920s, and even then they'll be about as supportive as two kerchiefs tied together with wet paper. Sound familiar, anyone? For now, dear, we are going to truss you up in your corset. My own note, for those of us who choose to corset upon occasion, a well-fitting corset should feel like a good hug. You should never at any point have your breathing impaired. Please refer to a corseteer such as Timeless Trends, Fairy Goth Mother, or What Katie Did for more information than I can give you in this video. You've seen the x-rays of ribs grotesquely crushed by years of corset use, haven't you? Isn't it awful? Those horrid stays, the straight vertical strip that gives the corset its power and shape, are made of unforgiving steel, or the nearly as unpleasant whalebone. Actually, whale baleen, but no matter. How are you going to breathe? How are you going to bend over? How are you going to move at all? Once you are assisted into your corset, back-laced or front-hooked, sometimes both, you'll discover something. Corsets aren't that bad. They don't have to be tightened to the point of spleen displacement. They can function as legitimate support garments. What are you supporting? Yeah? Huh? What are you supporting? Mm-hmm. Sir, this is my emotional support disturbance. holding up your bosoms, perhaps even putting off the inevitable day when they will lie exhausted and battle-worn against your belly, flapping like tired little beaver tails with every step you take. Wow. For women are fleshy creatures, and many of us feel more comfortable when that flesh is secure. Corsets, like the spanks and bras of the future, provide privacy privacy that women are willing to sacrifice a little comfort for. In the 21st century, if your bust was drooping and your bottom flat and wide enough to shoot pool on, you could arrange your clothing to keep that information to yourself. But now, dear traveler, you don't have the option of flowing blouses and jeans made of fabrics that were originally developed for astronauts. No joke. You have a corset, and it works pretty well. As for breathing and bending over, there are smaller, shorter corsets that can provide a working woman some, get your tail out of the book, some support while letting her scrub and sew her way to an early grave. Your chemise is clean, by the way, because one of your maids spent an hour dunking it in near boiling water and lye until her hands cracked and burned, then wringing, hanging, ironing, and starching it. It isn't uncommon for even a small household to take two days to get the washing done. Pardon me a moment. Yes, I'm from Georgia. Coke is a meal in and of itself. A woman who is not of the working class doesn't have much reason to bend over in the 19th century. And if she does, a lady lowers herself straight back by bending her knees. She does not stick her posterior in the air like a common prairie dog, or like Luther over there. Oh look, your maid has laid out your dress. This is precisely why you chose this travel destination. What a lovely frock. Such exquisite embroidery and hand stitching. Such a voluminous skirt. No, not yet. No touch. First, 
put on a loose shirt over the corset. Corset covers prevent everyone from seeing the outlines of your underpinnings. Interestingly enough, a slip does rather the same thing with a dress. Foundation garments give your garments a foundation. That's what gives any outfit the silhouette you desire. Now, fetch the cage. Cage crinoline, that is. We have a picture. Cage crinoline, circa 1865. Very similar to the farthingales of the Renaissance festival era. Yes, I said festival era. It covers a lot of ground. You've happened to land mid-century, for now, during the hoop skirt craze, where the simple flowing dresses of the Regency, think Jane Austen, have been replaced by the biggest, loudest, bell-shaped silhouettes this side of Notre Dame Cathedral. Yards upon yards of heavy wool have been used to construct your dress. To hold it up, you need to strap on your cage crinoline. It is precisely what it sounds like, a wire cage suspended from your hips or shoulders over which your skirt will rest. These cages, which in their naked state are indistinguishable from something you trap wild dogs in, have a sensible use. Without it, you won't be able to walk. The cage structure distributes the incredible weight of the fabric and holds the hem away from your feet so you won't trip. Well, you're probably going to trip anyway because you're wearing 40 pounds of clothing, your shoes are crazy pinchy, and there is an amazing amount of horse poop and other things in the street. But it won't be because your dress is too close to your feet. Now, we add a petticoat or six, depending on how much ruffle you need to meet this year's fashion and hooray! You're ready to have your maids tug your dress over your head and button you up. You look lovely, dear. Which makes me almost not want to tell you how uncomfortable and smelly your dress actually. You know what? We can just wait on that a bit. You look lovely. And now we return to the first question you asked yourself this morning as you looked through your undergarments. Why don't any of the 47 pieces of clothing I'll be wearing have a crotch? Well, let's do this. Let me sneak you a pair of your old bikini cuts to wear under everything else. No one will know. In fact, wear them to the ball tonight. There you'll be, having a lovely time, dancing, eating delicate bonbons, and trading even more delicate bonbons. You won't even care how thick the stench of body odor coated with heavy floral perfumes is. Bathing, you will soon learn, is a huge pain in the butt in the 19th century. Thick perfume is so much easier. Now, Run upstairs, squat over a chamber pot, pee really quick, and run back down to the party. Yes, hoist that enormous poundage of wool, steel, and cotton with one arm, and then pull down your underpants with the other. Go on, go on. Anyone who's ever had to use the privy at a Renaissance festival, I feel your pain, girl, I feel your pain. You fell over, didn't you? Yes. And by the time you're all buttoned and laced up again, everyone will suspect you left the party for some other more embarrassing reason, like kissing the stable boy or diarrhea. That is why your dainty bits aren't covered, because even though no one in a Victorian society will admit to it, a lady has to pee, and closed drawers, as they will eventually come to be known because you draw them up and down, make that practically impossible for a fully dressed lady. Crotches will come together slowly as the century winds down. First, buttons will appear. And then finally, crotches will be sewn up altogether. I'm going to pause for a second and say it was definitely a man who designed the crotch of a woman's undergarment to button. Sis, we would not do that to each other. I don't care how much you hate the other girl. You would not do that to her. This will be most likely due to the extreme narrowing of skirts that becomes popular in the 1880s. Crinolines will bundle themselves up into bustles, which are a lot like crinolines, just for your rump instead. A lady will not only be able to raise her skirts, 
but she will once again fit into her outhouse. Although that may not be necessary. <laughs> necessary, they used to call it a necessary. As most upper class families will install indoor plumbing around the 1890s. Interestingly enough, this is mentioned on Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. The more you know. Speaking of which, it's time to learn how to navigate your new potty options. I believe you'll find them far more creative and numerous than you'd ever want them to be. Wonderful. That has been chapter one of Unmentionable, The Victorian Lady's Guide to Sex, Marriage, and Manners by Teresa O'Neill. This has been Anna Reads. Once Unmentionable is done, I will be considering your suggestions. If you have something you would like me to read, feel free to contact me via Instagram at serenity underscore sweet or on Twitter at serenity sweet 13. Excuse me, my Instagram is serenity sweet. I knew I was going to mess something up and I don't edit these videos. Contact me on YouTube, I'll consider your suggestions. Love you guys, have a wonderful day.